what I do sat through a training with me before. So we're here, I see the eye roll. So we're, we're here because I want to talk specifically about the risks, what the risks of module 12 are. And I fully, I'm going to start by saying I fully expect for you guys to have a, a great module and um, to have it safely and for everything to go well for you. But it's really important just to touch on a few things. And um, any guesses what they are? Acid. What's that? Acid. Yep. Yeah, it's one of the biggest things. Any, anything else? What do you think? <laughs> like there is a there, right? <laughs> they just like swap it the wrong way. <laughs> Disaster. We're off to a great start, folks. Strong start here. Oh, it gets even better, right? My word. This is this is why this is why I'm here to talk about these five things, and, and really a lot of it is TFA. So uh, trifluoro acetic acid can be very 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 unforgiving. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about the base that Brad talked about, but just realized that you work with the base too. That's that's bad to get in your skin or in your eyes. So we've had on campus we've had two TFA exposures to people's skin that resulted in a very, very bad burn, localized small burn. Um, at least one required skin graft. You don't want it on your skin, okay? So if nothing else, take that away from this little chat we're gonna have. I don't expect you to have any problems, but um, for that not to be clear would be really, wouldn't be cool if you need to know that, right? Um, and you might have already known that up till now, or you might have just learned that when I said it. So here's TFA. Um, you're not going to work with much. Um, this is what we want you to understand when you work with it, that basically you don't want to understand. So, so different ways to not get it on your skin is when you think about, if you're working with your dominant hand with it in the fume hood, you think about what your non-dominant hand is doing. In other words, you need to have the other hand in the, in the fume hood when you're handling it. Does that make sense? Are you play petting it? Did I have this right? Yeah. So if you're pipetting it, in, let's say you're right-handed, um, is it necessary to have your left hand in that fume hood along with it? Yes or no? What do you think? Mm -hmm. So let's bring it back to, uh, if, if, you do, if you do any uh, kind of like food prep work, who's ever used a sharp knife before? Right, like Scott, what are you getting at? If I, use, if I have a sharp knife, and, and I'm cutting something, Am I gonna, would I ever cut my dominant hand? Probably not, it's the other hand that's there to help that could get cut, right? So if you're working with TFA and you're, and you're pipetting, you wanna think about where that other hand is. Make sense? Okay, so, and you wanna think about any kind of gap that you could possibly have between your, your glove and your lab coat. If I get something on that skin, that's really a problem. Okay, so besides me talking about this in generalities, let's be very specific. So what we need you to do when you work with trifluoroacetic acid is to wear is to wear something called a silver shield glove. Anybody ever seen these before? Who's ever seen one? Put up your hand. No, maybe. Um, so who has big hands? Beer. Hands almost the size of mine. So, uh, you do me a favor just put this on. It's clean, so you don't have to worry about bad things getting out of your water. So, um, so what do you what do you think of that glove? Very spacious. It's what? <laughs> Very large. It's large. And uh, do you can you pass me that piece of glove? You just pick up that foot. Yeah, put put that put that down for me, and, and pick it up and tell me if it's easy, yeah, hard. Easy. Is it doable? It's doable. So. Yeah, it, it, you kind of concerned about your dexterity. Yes, you should be. <laughs> <laughs> right. So do me a favor and put this put this under the glove. 
That's a clean one, too. Put that over the glove. And um, so we, we need you to wear, we need you to wear these gloves. It's gonna, not, nothing goes through it chemically, and it offers more of a gauntlet, more protection to your lab coat. So you know where your lab coat, you know to wear your safety glasses, you know everybody knows this, right? This is the next thing, if you work with TFA, we need you to wear the silver shield glove, and let me know when you get the nitrile glove over and move them. So uh, this is what we need you to wear. It's not, it's not up for today, okay? Does that make sense? Everybody good with that? So far? When you pick up that piece of chalk again once you have it on there, and tell me if there's any difference. Did, is it better? It is a little better. Okay, so your dexterity improves in general when you put nitrile gloves over this silver shield um, laminate glove that is hell to work with otherwise. Right? So that's the message. And so that's a good thing. Just uh, sign it by. So, everybody, if you could write your name, print your name, and then print your Kubros. That, that way I know that you're here, so that you're here. And uh, I, do have a, I do have a pen if anybody needs it. I'm like jumping around, so it's really easy to be held, I guess. So, um, so, that's the deal with TSA. You're going to wear your lab coat, you're going to wear your safety glasses, you're going to have that awareness. Um, DMF. So DMF can be um, problematic with skin contact, not in the same way. It can be an irritant. Some people would say it's a sensitizer, possibly. Um, this OSHA permissible exposure limit at 10 parts per million inhaled over an eight-hour workday. You know, we have our work inside the fume hoods, just like you work. You work with TFA in the fume hoods, right? All this stuff is understood. You work with the fume hose, you wear your lab coat, you wear your safety glasses, and like the gloves are kind of the next step. So, um, <clears throat> DMF, problematic to breathe in, not great to get on your skin. So when you work with DMF, we, we want you to either wear that, you have a choice, or you can double glove nitrile. You have, a choice, you have a choice when you work with DMF. So it's my understanding that you'll be, you'll, the work that you do, you'll be, you know, something is built out and it tends to drip and a lot of the constituent is DMF. Am I right on this one, Carly? Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so uh, you'll inevitably get this on your gloves when you do your work. You could change out that top layer of gloves or change out that double glove of nitrile and start over again um, if your gloves get impacted. It's not that big of a deal, you just want to be aware of it. Single glove nitrile for DMF, I just don't recommend it. And f in general for research, and for you guys, we need you, to, we need you to wear double nitrile or this when you work with DMF. TFA, you have to wear this. Is that, is that clear? Okay, I'm not, I'm not trying to chastise you, I just want to be clear, because this is different from what you usually have done in most of your modules up till now. So next thing, um, you've seen this slide before. Irritants and sensitizers, and irritant is, up, is many, many, many chemicals. Uh, causes some inflammation to living tissue. A sensitizer is something that can cause an allergic reaction. Um, much like, example uses like poison ivy, right? Or uh, latex can be problematic for some people. And first exposure is not a problem, and then later on it can be a big problem could just be a rash, but could go all the way to uh, uh, asthma like symptoms and anaphylactic shock is a very dramatic outcome. Um, not likely, but you just want to be aware of what a sensitizer is. As a review, we've talked about this before, I think, with pretty much everybody in the room. So why am I showing you this slide? Uh, because what Brad said, that HATU is a sensitizing agent. It's not that recognizes the sensitizing agent. There are still safety data sheets out there that don't call it out as a sensitizing agent, which is what it is. Um, so because of this, we want to make sure that you're, you're minimizing um, your exposure or you're not getting exposed to it. Um, so uh, Carly has been doing the weighing out of this powder or this, would you call it like granular? Almost like salt, is that what it's like? I haven't handled it myself. I've seen it plenty of times in a container, but I haven't handled it. 
So, um, so we want to make sure it's not being aerosolized, put into the air. Um, and we want to make sure that any spills are cleaned up. If you have this dissolved in something, you want to clean it up and realize that it could, it could remain after the spill um, dries out otherwise. Does that make sense? Um, so we want to minimize your exposure to it and, and, and make sure you have awareness that it, it can be a sensitizing agent, that you do want to be careful when you're working around it. If you feel as though you're having any um, health effects from it, um, you know, like anything else, speak up. It's not likely that it's going to be dramatic. Um, and I think it's very unlikely that you are going to have any problems because the module is set up in such a, um, it, it, it's a well-tuned module, I think. So, um, so I think you're going to be fine. But just have that awareness that HATU um, is a sensitizing agent, potentially. It can be problematic. If somebody were to breathe it in or have skin contact, that's sort something. Of so we're taking a lot of precautions here, so I think you're going to be fine. Um, here's a slide you've seen before about um, flammability and flammable solvents. And I have this up here because we're moving on to ether as one of the five things I wanted to talk about. And so ether is highly flammable. It's one of the most flammable things you can possibly work with in the way of solvents. And um, you know the vapor is two and a half times heavier than air. And we know that um, if vapor of a flammable solvent goes someplace um, where there's a hot surface, um, you can have ignition, and you don't know where those vapors are necessarily. So you're going to manage your ether well, and I think you're, you're going to be fine, like I said before. Um, I wrote, wrote this slide, I need to make a, a bad pun, but other points is you work with needles. So the, the needles are actually, um, Carly, I think we're getting, I think Randall is getting the, the flat, yeah. the blunt needles, because mm -hmm. um, you don't need to have sharp needles, and, and that's a good thing, but there's still some risk. You still want to manage those, make sure you know where they're going and you're done with them, that you're not leaving them around in a way that someone can get stuck with them. Obviously, they're not going regular trash. And uh, I understand the EDT stinks, and so you want to have awareness of that and work with it instead of the fume hood because of a strong odor. And any questions so far? So keep on wearing your flame resistant lab coat. Um, you can get them changed out if you if you feel as though you need to. You can't get them laundered. Um, usually just kind of push through the module without them being laundered. But if you feel as though you had a spill and you're concerned, you can switch them out, talk to Randy, um, talk to Marius about that. But please do wear your, your FR coat. And um, I it wasn't, I didn't take that picture. I'm glad to say that I didn't take that picture. <laughs> it's a stock photo that I grabbed. And uh, so I promise it's gonna get warm again. I promise you it'll get warm again. It'll stay warm. I've been in New England my whole life. And uh, it does get warm. And uh, when it does, please wear the footwear that you need to wear. Please wear long pants. Um, please just keep doing that. Nobody wants to tell you to go back uh, from whence you came and change up your footwear. I've had to have that conversation, and it, it just like why? Why are we talking about this? You know. So take care of your feet and wear closed-toed shoes. And by that, we don't mean ballet slippers. I've been asked that before. <laughs> so wear something that's going to protect your feet if you get a spill. Um, so, and please wear long pants. You know, keep in mind where the where the showers are and how you use them. Mercy showers are there. If somebody had a, um, a a chemical spill that went through the lab coat, or God forbid, somebody's clothing is on fire. That's why we have emergency showers. Uh, you activate them by pulling down that that triangle looks like a dinner belt. Um, you pull that down. It's 15 minutes to use. A lot of water will come out. Somebody needs to call 100 from a house phone. Um, and that's why we have emergency showers. We have them all over the place, right? High wash stations are by six. <clears throat> we have um, dozens in the undergrad teaching lab, know where they are, know how they work. How do you use this high wash station? How does it work? How would you activate it? You squeeze it, so, you know, pictures are only two dimensional, of course, right? So you, there's a handle here, you actually squeeze it. And, and I say this because <clears throat> I've done lab tours and trainings in lab as a lab tour, 
And I was like, who wants to activate the IWAR station, not the undergrad teaching lab, but in the research lab? 35 people there. Who wants to activate it? I'll do it. The person grabbed it and started to pry it apart in front of his PI. I was like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't mean to embarrass the person. I, I'm not interested in shaming anybody. It's not, I don't like doing that. But, uh, but you're just going to know. You, you squeeze it, a pin drops down and it keeps it running when you take your hand off of it. And uh, you can bring your eyes to it, your face to it, and eyes wide open. You have to be wide open for it to work. It's really hard to do if you have something in your eyes, right? It is on a hose. You can pull it up to get it to your face if you need to. It's really hard to find if you're by yourself, so that's why you don't work by yourself in the undergrad teaching lab, right? So, somebody calls 100. Just know where your spill pillows are in general. Some are white like this and some are the pink ones. And um, in general, if somebody did get a chemical burn or, or a, f um, a heat burn, like a physical burn, um, it's 15 minutes of water on that injury and somebody uh, calls 100, or they call MIT, 100 is from the house phone, right? Or it's from somebody's cell phone, it's 617-253-1212, that's MIT police. That's a good number to have on your cell phone anyway. Now if your cell phone has uh, the MIT app, you go to emergency and you'll get MIT police. So we don't usually use 911 because it's hard for people outside of here to find our buildings. Um, and we talked about burning clothing, very, very unlikely scenario, but we just want to know, that, know about that. So um, if you have any kind of injury or concerns, um, please let Carly know, let, um, let Marius know about it. And if you do get checked out at MIT Medical, because it's something that kind of crops up later on, please let us know about that. If there, God forbid, there ever were a severe situation uh, in terms of an injury in the undergrad teaching lab, we're calling from 100 from a house phone or 617-253-1212 from a cell phone and we're waiting there for help to come and um, you guys know about evacuations. So I don't think we need to get into that again. Any questions? Okay, so so I just want to talk about those five things and hit some basics and did everybody sign in? Who's that sign in chief? Did everybody get to it? Okay, thanks for your time, I really appreciate it.